It's the only wrestling podcast on earth with two former Major League Baseball All-Stars. Jason Kindle, who is not here. Dimitri Young, who is here. What's going on, Dimitri? What's up? One four-time Stanley Cup champion and Darren McCarty. Darren? We Gentlemen. Have, we have Lars Fredrickson. Yeah, Dennis, out of, out of respect here, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to professionally tell you to, to shut the fuck up, and I'm just going to start now because I'm really the only person people are interested in hearing from. Ladies and gentlemen, just in case you're deaf, dumb, blind, stupid, or I don't know, let's just assume poor since you're listening to this podcast. My name is Maxwell Jacob Friedman. I am the youngest and fastest rising star in the history of professional wrestling. And as you can see, I'm really taking this podcast seriously as I'm wearing my Under Armour shirt and, I don't know, jeans, <laughs> might as well be pajamas. Um, you know, such a great podcast idea, having nine people talking over each other at the same time. <laughs> Truly revolutionary stuff. Lars Sullivan, man, really appreciate you taking time off on your day job of massaging Phil Brooks's balls. Very nice of you. Uh, Darren, Darren, where are you at, buddy? Let's get the camera on Darren. Right here, Lars. Right here. Oh, there you are, buddy. Darren, I heard you like to fancy yourself as a great professional wrestling mind. And that makes sense, man. I think all my ideas are great, too, if I was high 24-7. So it adds up. Oh, man, Dimitri, I don't know what you're laughing about, you fat sack of shit. I was watching <laughs> highlight videos of you slow jogging the first plate, looking like your belly was superseding your pants. Terrifying hey, stuff. Hey, I did Petey, like where you at, buddy? I'm, where you at? I'm right here, man. There you are, Peter. Peter, I see you get offended a lot of the time because a lot of these guys are using the Canadian Destroyer. Is it upsetting to know that everybody else is stealing from Amazing Red, too? <laughs> I don't know. Is that, is that, is that a rhetorical question? Are you going? Pete, if, I, if it went over your head, I'm not shocked, considering the fact that you're Canadian. Look, guys, if you have any questions, fire them off. Let's try to make this quick and painless as possibly can, it can be. <laughs> hi, hi, MJF. Uh, who's the bigger um, big man, Wardlow or Hammerstone? All right, so never, never double biflex ever again, for the love of God. <laughs> I literally almost just puked in my coffee. Uh, that's one. Two, that's a tough question, man. Both of those men are gigantic brick shit houses. They're both uh, not, not too hard to look at on the eyes, and they're both incredible wrestlers. Um, if they went toe to toe, though, I'd have to give the dub to Wardlow specifically because Wardlow has an MMA background and I don't believe Hammer does, although I love Hammer to death. If he comes in tan enough, it's it's anybody's game, really. <laughs> That's it. Tanner Ortiz get a title shot before you and Chris. What's that? You. I said, are you pissed that you don't get the title shot before Santana and Ortiz? Absolutely not, buddy. Look, Santana and Ortiz are like family to me. They're part of the inner circle. The inner circle is my family. And look, I hope they win the belt, man, because then we get to go to that pay-per-view and we get to have fun out there with our friends, you know? More power to them if they win those tag straps. All right, hey, I I'm going to go next. If, if you know, I hope you don't cut me off uh, mid-sentence with this question. But um, all right, so... Got your spot on the main roster, AEW, all right? But you've only been wrestling, I don't even know how many years. Not that long. I know that for no, sure. No, not um, that long. How many Gosh, years is it? Now? It has now been five years. Jeez. All right. So it's safe to say that we probably haven't seen the best version of MJF yet. Not, not saying that, you know, you're not our best version, but, like, do, do you set, A, do you set goals for yourself? Like, hey, what am I going to do next? And, like, um do you always like work towards like perfecting your craft? Peter, very good question for somebody who's Canadian. What I will say is this. <laughs> I think what you said makes a lot of sense. I am wildly talented. For crying out loud, I'm a prodigy. But the scary thing is, is I'm only going to get better with age. I'm like a fine wine. That's what's terrifying. I'm already one of the best in the game now, and I'm only going to get better. Lord can only know what's going to happen in my career. As far as goals, though, I have one goal. I've only had one goal from the start, and that has become the AEW world champion. And I look forward to doing that in the very near future. 
just wondering, you know, I've, I've seen you, you know, obviously do all your stuff in the ring and you're a very talented uh, young man. Yeah. Most importantly, you're singing. You ever think about taking your singing somewhere besides professional wrestling? I mean, I think you could front a band. How, if you could front a band, what kind of band would you be in? Well, definitely not rancid. Let's be honest here, okay? I'm just being honest here. Um, I'm more of a Frank Sinatra kind of guy. That's my type of music. But I will say this. Um, I was hit up by a record label called Rhino. They told me they represent you, Lars. Is that correct? They said they had interest in me as well. Is that accurate? No, Rhino was an ex-girlfriend. Sorry. Oh, understood, understood, understood. <laughs> no, but yeah, man. I mean, I was an all-state tenor one in high school. I was an acapella. I was in choir. I also just so happened to be an all-state amateur wrestler and an all-state middle linebacker. So long story short, I got a lot of puss, and it was a good ride. It was a good ride, Lars. As far as bands go, I mean, if I really wanted to, I think I can do what Chris Jericho did. I think... If I really wanted to, I can start my own band and get a couple platinum records going. But as of right now, my sheer focus is on professional wrestling. Do you have any interests outside of professional wrestling? Because we see now. Oh, Dennis, fuck, dude. I hate when you talk. You are the worst part of the show. <laughs> um, just give me a second here. I have a headache. I just have a headache from <laughs> your voice. Sorry. All right. Can you can you repeat oh. the question? But for the love of God, try to be less grating, please, Dennis. Please. <clears throat> Do you have any? Uh, oh God! <laughs> oh God! It's like bees are in my ears, <laughs> Dennis. All right. All right. For the love of God, I don't know what it is doing, but it's like nails on a chalkboard. Okay, Dennis. Please be a little bit more professional. I'll text my questions to PD and have him ask him. I appreciate that, Dennis. As a matter of fact, that's what I want you to do for the rest of this podcast. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. All right. Hey, so MJ, I'm sorry, Dimitri. I just want to get this out of there, okay? No, go ahead. Um, what, one of the storylines I remember is when you were injured, okay? But this yeah. injury angle you did, I did the exact angle. same. Th Hold on. Let's just, let you, and then you can answer this however you want. All right. Okay. So like, I don't know, 2007, right. Um, working for impact. We were in Nashville. It was slam anniversary. I haven't been on TV for months and they pulled everybody out for this fan fest. Okay. And you had to say whatever it is, talk about your match or whatever. I had no match. So I said, uh, guys, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I, I can't, you know, compete because I'm nursing uh injury. You know, it's a uh, hangnail. And I went in onto the hangnail and did the whole bit. I got mad, mad heat from management. Mad mm. heat, right? You do the same angle, and everybody's like kissing your ass and loving yeah, yeah, yeah. it. So, I mean, with that, was was that your idea, management? Um, did you get heat for it? Like, what's what's going on with that? Well, Pete, the thing is, the reason why it worked when I did it and it didn't work when you did it is because I have this thing called charisma. That's A. B oh. is <laughs> everything I do – Peter, everything I do is real. It's not an angle. It's not a storyline. At the uh, time, I had a serious hangnail injury, and I had to nurse it. Thank God I was in Plainview, Long Island, New York, the best place in the world. You guys wouldn't know anything about that. But I rehabilitated my nail. My nail is now stronger than ever. If I can be honest, sometimes I get stopped in the street, and people go, my God, your nail just looks so strong. And you know, I get it often. I honestly, I get it often, but no, I have never gotten heat uh, from management. Tony Khan understands that a we're best buds. I don't know if you guys know that me and T Kizzle, we, we go way back and B Tony knows where his bread's buttered, man. I'm going to be the face of this company for the next 25 years. If daddy needs to stay out because his hangnails hurt, you're going to let daddy stay out for a little bit. That's just how it works. Oh Thank my you. God. Oh my God, you are such an asshole. You remind me of Barry Bonds, man. Jeez. Uh, Bonds. Barry Bonds. That... Barry Bonds? I remind you of Barry Bonds? Yeah. You're an asshole extraordinaire. Good God. I love it. Darren. I would have made the Sean Avery. I'm for sure that you know who Sean Avery, you must be best friends with Sean Avery. Darren, you, you are so high. I don't think you even know what you're saying. Your words are coming out so slow right now. 
Do you even know what's going on? It's very nice. We both have the same coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to know what's in your coffee. And by that, I mean, is it straight vodka? Thanks, bro. That's where you're, that's where you're wrong. That's why it's what is it? cannabis. Coffee. <laughs> It's like a right. poor bro. You were right. I mean, you had it down. If you stick to the weed, then you had it down, bro. But you're I don't the, know, man. You're, you are the you are the best, though. Seriously, you are the best. And I always wanted to know: Do you look up to people, or did like I know that people aren't really on your level? Nobody I mean, is. That's you, alive. That's what I'm saying. So, <laughs> other than Frank Sinatra, because yeah, you know that style, that Rat Pack style. You have that class. I've seen it. I've been around, not me, but I've been around that higher echelon, so I recognize it. Absolutely. Saying, so who are the, you know, some of these influences that maybe some of these guys wouldn't know, but, you know, because you're you're deep and you can tell. That's why you're going to be a legend. and You already are. It's just the rest of the people don't know. This guy gets it. Here, Here's the deal. Uh, Roddy Piper, uh, I've said it once, I'll say it a thousand times, if there's one person who... I idolized growing up who made me want to be a professional wrestler was Roddy Piper. Um, there's a lot of other names though, if I'm being honest. Uh, I love Buddy Landell, Landell's work, especially when he was in Mid-South. Um, also, I'm a uh, big fan of Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert with Global. Um, Hot Stuff is a guy that not a lot of people know about, which is a travesty because his rivalry with Jerry Lawler is some of the best professional wrestling you will ever see. Um, I think the issue with professional wrestling now and with people in my generation is now is they grew up watching guys like Petey Williams instead of watching guys like the Ric Flairs and the Tully Blanchards of the world. <laughs> and what's happened now is everybody goes in there and they try to think of the best move possible. What they're, what they're not concerned with is winning. That's all I'm concerned with. That's all Roddy Piper was concerned with. That's all Greg the Hammer Valentine was concerned with. That's all Big Cat Ernie Ladd was concerned with. And the list goes on and on. I'm a student of the game. I don't believe anybody in my age bracket knows more about professional wrestling on this planet. And I think that's why every single time I'm on your TV set, I maximize my minutes better than anybody else in the business today. Do you also look at the old school managers? Like, I mean, cause you do remind me and have an aura of Jim Cornette. Of course, know, of course, man. So I worked with Jim Cornette more than I think people realize when I was in major league wrestling and um, getting to go back and forth with him. Uh, look, is he a fan of guys on my roster? Absolutely not. But if I'm being honest, neither am I, uh, but he, <laughs> he's a very smart guy. Uh, he understands how to manipulate an audience. Um, I loved his work. I loved Bobby the brain Heenan's work. Um, even Grand Wizard, he might not have necessarily been the greatest promo of all time, but the guy understood how to manipulate a crowd without even speaking. Um, I mean, there's been so many great managers of the past. Uh, Paul Heyman, obviously, we're both Jews. We're both very affluent, and we're both very good at speaking, and we're both from New York. So Paul Heyman, also another guy who was most certainly a big influence on me. Um, I, I got a question from Dennis. <laughs> it says um can you ask him uh about roasting podcasts because that's what you've been doing lately yeah uh, i'm sorry but this question already sucks ass <laughs> maybe maybe i need to paraphrase this gave it, it to you see mjf um, see what i'm saying that's so, gave it, obviously. here's the question pretty much um yeah two parts how did you start that how why you know like what was your inspiration behind it or whatever and then um are you going to roast us as well? I mean, I believe I already have, but if you're begging no, I for mean, more, like, you know, Petey, for the for the world, like, you, you know, how you've been doing it. I see. So you mean like on social media? Yes. Okay. So for me personally, I am not a character. I am not portraying anyone. This is me 24-7. I have an issue with guys in my generation looking and appearing and acting a certain way on their TV set and then they go on the Twitter machine and they're like, ah, oh, gee, Willikers, thanks for watching my match today. I love you guys. Kiss, kiss, hug, hug. After they literally just had like a stabbing, you know, on TV or they beat up somebody's grandmother and then they're taking a Twitter and talking about how much 
they they love they love this business and they love the fans. It makes me sick to my stomach, dude. And uh, so for me personally, I, I'm never going to be the guy that sucks up to the audience. I'm never going to look for likes or retweets. I'm just going to be me 24 seven. And I think that's what makes the best stars in professional wrestling. Um, I hate to give CM Punk credit because somebody asked him who he thought were great up and coming stars in AEW. And one of the answers was Pillman. And at no point did he say my name, but I, I am going to give him credit because I'm salt of the earth and I'm, Let's, let's face it, I'm just a great person. I think CM Punk, when he was on the independence, um, did a great job of never wavering on who he was as an individual when he was around fans. Um, I believe Ric Flair and the Horsemen all did an incredible job when they were around fans of never wavering, never, never being like, oh, thank you so much for watching the product. We're stars. Why am I going to go out of my way to make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside? when you're lucky to be breathing the same air as me. And that's the way I approach life day in and day out. Wow. Now talking, to, now, talk, now talking about that, that is ruthless. I was thinking about when you were in the dynasty and it seemed like you were the leader. Now that you're in the inner circle, uh, I'm, I, yeah, I'm watching on Wednesday, we all are. Uh, it looks like you're trying to um, weasel your way into uh, oh, here the, we go. the leader. Uh, yes, here we go. Here we go, Dimitri. All right, here's the deal, all right? <laughs> I love those guys like brothers. Why on earth, Dimitri, would I want to take over the inner circle? It's absolutely ridiculous. Chris Jericho is the greatest professional wrestler in the history of the business. Who am I? Who am I to try to to try to take him out of his spot and take the group over. I mean, that's just lunacy. And that's my issue with Sammy Guevara. And I'd like to talk about that real quickly. First of all, I'm still nursing my rib injury, okay? I just spoke to my doctor earlier and he told me he was only an inch away from potentially breaking my rib and having it go into my lung and puncturing my lung. But no, everybody wants to talk about how great it is that Sammy Guevara quit the inner circle. Well, yay, rah, rah, Sammy Guevara. Sammy Guevara hit me for no reason. He claimed I wanted to take over the inner circle with zero proof. And then he claimed that I was recording him with zero proof. And now because of his actions, everybody thinks that I do want to take over the inner circle. Guys, I cannot make this more clear. Six months ago on AEW Dynamite, I told the world that I understood why I didn't win the AEW world title against Dictator John. It's because I did not have backup. I have backup now. Why do I need to be the leader? That's just so ridiculous. Only a true sociopath would not leave good enough alone. And I'm not that guy. I am not that guy. All right. Well, hey, well, it's good to hear you're not a sociopath. That's good. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay. You're young, up and coming. Well, you're not even up and coming anymore. You're there. You're, you're, yeah, I'm the guy. The, yeah. Let's be the honest. Yeah. Right. So, now you're going to be getting in a tough spot, I would say. And maybe you've already seen it. I don't, you, you tell me, you see. We're talking that... sexually. It is hard to get these rats away from me, dude. You have no idea. Is that where you're that Question where you're... one. So, uh, okay. Good. But uh, you see other up and coming talent trying to rip off your stuff now. You know what I mean? Um, like, like your character, not your character. I shouldn't say character. You, are they trying to rip off your personality? So if I'm being com completely honest, I don't believe so. And if they are, they're doing a terrible job at it because I, I haven't seen any, anything like it. And I think no one's dumb enough to try it because I'm just me amped up, you know, to, to 110. And I think you'd be a fool to try to be MJF because there's only one brother and there only ever will be one. And uh, I do feel bad for guys when they can't figure out their own lane because they're not either A, talented enough or B, creative enough to figure out their own stuff. Um, kind of like Petey when you took Amazing Red's uh, finishing maneuver and then <laughs> claimed it as your own. It's, it's cheap and unacceptable. Let me ask you this. Uh, yeah. You know, we got to, you know, obviously, and I say this every show because I believe it, we're in, a, we're in a, a, a brand new golden age of wrestling. You've got, mm. you got AEW with Impact and now New Japan's in the mix. 
Does yeah. it interest you at all to go to jump to those other promotions and and wrestle some of the guys there? Look, I care about two things, green and gold. Now, if I want more green or I want more gold because I've gotten as much as I possibly could out of all elite wrestling, or I feel that there's a certain piece of hardware that I want in another company, I wouldn't be shocked as a wrestling fan if I see MJF make a jump because when I see an opportunity, I seize it. That's just me. That's the person I am. Um, as far as New Japan Pro Wrestling goes, I think there's a lot of interesting matchups for me there. I think there's a lot of interesting matchups for me in Impact. Right now, however, I am focused on making sure that the inner circle is the most successful group in all professional wrestling. Would there ever come a day where MJF needs to step foot outside and go to another company to prove not only is he the best in AEW, but he's the best, period? Sure. That's a completely sensical scenario. Well, there'll be definitely be one company that try and change your um, character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you would you well, allow that to happen if you was to go yeah. to the, the great northeast? Again, all I care about is green. So does D and gold. So if those if those boys over there sign a fat enough check when my contract's up. Who's to say where I'm going to go? I only care about two things, green and gold. That's it. That's it. But as of right now, I will say this. My intention for the next 25 years is genuinely to be the face of AEW. As of right now. Hmm. The best part about you, MJF, is you know who you are. Dimitri said you're an asshole and you know it. I love you. Yeah. And that's the thing. Is there is there a match out there that you haven't had that maybe look for in the future? Like, does somebody intrigue you enough? Or, I, you know, I hate to say it has earned your respect because that's not even – it's just, but maybe their talent level could maybe you could get something from them. Is there somebody in the company that we're not seeing? So somebody inside of AEW who I haven't wrestled yet. Or, or with New Japan being in, in, or TNA or something like that. Like the door has been open. So now there's a conversation. If I, if this was two weeks ago, if I keep it inside AEW, but now it could be a TNA guy. It could be a, New Japan guy. I'm just wondering if from from your point of view, is there somebody that deserves a match with MJF? Well, I, don't, I don't think anybody deserves anything for me. Yeah, I don't either. But I don't either. If I, but if I, I just... had to if I had to throw a name out there, um, since I've only been on national TV for a year, which is something people easily forget because I've made such a hefty impact. But I've I've for whatever reason, when fans see something that they they despise and they, they just hate it from the inside, the bowels of their guts. What they want to do to discredit that person is to start comparing them. Now, I must be tweeted in about a thousand tweets a day with a guy named Jay White. And I'm getting real sick of it. Okay? Yeah. I'm going to be honest. I have not seen enough of this man's stuff. But I can tell you this. Nobody's on my level, okay? Nobody is. So I would like to have that match just to quell any ridiculousness that is these comparisons. As far as outside of that sphere goes, a match that I also hear a lot of scuttlebutt about people wanting to see is me versus a gentleman by the name of Adam Cole. Um, as of right now, not a possibility. Could it be in the future? Who's to say? Thank you very much. Absolutely. Will you allow uh, Dennis to do a question? Pretty please. He has to text you. You know what? No, hold on a second. <laughs> I want to know about the first time you and Petey first met. When you first oh, met. absolutely. 
The story I want to hear is from harrowing, your side. to be honest. So what had occurred was, is I was on the independence at the time. I had to hide the fact that I was wildly affluent because I didn't want to get heat from the boys. Okay. I wasn't in a position of power yet where I could openly talk about my background. So I was working for that fat jalop Tommy Dreamer at the time for a promotion called House of Hardcore. <laughs> and Tommy uh, points his fat gelatinous fingers at me. And he asks me if I can pick up Petey Williams from the airport. Now, it took me a couple hours to remember who Petey Williams was. And then I remembered it was Scott Steiner's sidekick after, you know, going through the memory box. <laughs> so I hopped in my car. I picked this guy up. He gets in my car. And I got to tell you guys, it's the saddest thing. <sighs> he was so rude. I mean, he was oh. so devastatingly rude. He was telling, he was telling me. He was telling me I was driving too fast. Then he was telling me I was driving too slow. Then he's telling me he wasn't comfortable in the car. Then he kept on going on and on about how over he was in TNA. And it was just nonstop <laughs> him putting himself over for what felt like five hours on a 30 minute drive. Um, I still have flashbacks. Sometimes I wake up in a motel room with one of my Rizzes in a cold sweat. And they're like, Max, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I say, oh God, I just remember the time I had to drive Petey Williams to a House of Hardcore show. It was traumatic. <laughs> yep, that's, uh, that's pretty much exactly how it went. Uh, it's how it went down. <laughs> right. He's not even denying. Um, pretty, pretty close. Pretty close. Yeah. Uh, so, so, Petey, how I did got it? Uh, what's that? So, 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 your perspective. Let, what's your perspective? <laughs> oh, you know, go ahead, I, Pete, uh, Lie to the public. Oh man. Uh, geez. Um, my perspective. Well, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I want to answer that. Okay. Well then let's do, let's do this then. Okay. And you know, we're really happy that you're here and excluding Dennis, you got four guys in front of you that have been, you know, we've had some success over our, our career and, and you're still, you know, I know we understand that you're there. And you got five years in the business and you've, you're, you've risen to the top. You're the cream of the crop. But if there's one out of us four here that you would go to for advice, who would that be and why? Is there an option to take my own life? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we'll give you the tool to use. <laughs> Thank God. In, in that case, I would go to Dimitri for the advice because he'd give me a loaded gun. <laughs> All right. That is good. Well, um, <laughs> so uh, I, I got a text. Okay. Um, Here we go. Yep. What? Uh, it's it's a tough one. So you're young. What what kind of wrestling did you watch growing up? Fuck you, Dennis. What a stupid question. Oh my god, dude. <laughs> Let me just go into my rolodex of dumb generic questions to ask a star. Oh <laughs> shit, Dennis. Oh, all right. <laughs> Can you repeat the question, please? Um. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, tell you, how about you ask me what my favorite color is while you're at it? Jesus Christ. Okay. Whew. Uh, oh right. god. So um uh what kind of wrestling did you watch growing up? <laughs> oh good question, Pete. So if I had to really think about it and mull it over. Um so the first wrestling match I Lars, shut up. The first wrestling match <laughs> I ever watched, um, which is crazy. I was at a Hollywood video and I saw um some dude that kind of looked like a zombie on the front of the disc. And then I saw a ring and I was so confused. I'd never seen professional wrestling before. I was probably like six, six or seven. And I told my dad, I want this. I figured it was like a horror movie. I see, I look at the back as I put the DVD in. Yes, I had DVD, not VHS like you fucking dinosaurs. I put the <laughs> DVD in and I see a match that says Hell in a Cell. So now I'm vested. I'm like, this seems interesting. And I press play. 
So the first match in full I ever watched was Undertaker versus Mankind in that very famous Hell in a Cell match. So right off the whip, I mean, how could I not have been completely dragged in? And I was hooked after that. But then um, I didn't know it was still go. This is the crazy part. I didn't know wrestling was like going on and was on TV at the time. So I went on YouTube and I started watching like territory stuff like um, Piper in like Portland, like just like really old stuff. And then it started doing suggestions and it went to WWE and I was like, okay, WWE was from that Hell in a Cell match I watched. And then there was a commercial there that explained it's on Mondays at, at the time, I think eight o'clock, I really can't remember. And then I, from there, I just watched every week. And uh, I mean, I was so enthralled by it as a kid and how can you not be? And for me personally, I knew that's what I wanted to do from the jump. And I felt like that was the reason God put me on this earth was to be a professional wrestler and to be the best professional wrestler. I think pro wrestling needed me desperately. If I'm being honest, I think as Moses was to the Jews, I am a Messiah to professional wrestling fans because there hasn't been somebody like me in the business in such a long time. Um, and, and most of the time people like me die young, which is sad. Um, so yeah, man, I, that is what I watched. My first ever wrestling match was Undertaker versus Mankind, Hell in the Cell. Okay. Uh, now I want to follow up with that just because now it's in my head all, you know, my first match and all that kind of stuff. So a couple of things. What was the first live event you went to? Yeah. And then what was uh, part B, I guess you could say. What was your first, like, independent match? Like, I, I know with mine, I did security my first one. So, like, it wasn't yep. actually, like, the first time you were actually behind the scenes. So, uh, first live event you went to and, like, the first time you were actually, like, part of the business, you know. First live event I went to was the first ever Elimination Chamber match. For some reason, cages has revolved around my whole life. But the first ever Elimination Chamber match, it was in Madison Square Garden. My father took me. And I remember Shawn Michaels had that weird, shitty little Dutch boy haircut. And he hits the pose, right? And I look to my left and I look to my right. And everybody in that jam-packed arena was standing and flipping out. And I tugged my dad on the arm and I was like, dude, I can totally do this. And my dad was like, yeah, okay, whatever. Um... And turns out I was right, like I always am. Uh, my first <laughs> indie, my first indie show, is actually a crazy story. The first person I ever wrestled on the independence was Haku. What? Yep. Oh, damn. <laughs> yep. Wow. Yep. Yep. And uh, it was uh, my trainer, Kurt Hawkins. He he packed a bunch of us, the students, in his truck, and we drove to some bumblefuck town in upstate New York disgusting white trash gross hicks and then i get to the building and the promoter tells me he wants me to uh wrestle haku so my trainer very intelligently goes yeah no that is that is not a great idea he's he just started training like two months ago um what if he does a run-in and that was that. Obviously, I didn't tell Haku I was going to run in because I, I wanted the air of sneak attack on my side. And uh, unfortunately, that night uh, <laughs> did not work out for me. So. <laughs> hey, MJF. Hey, yeah. you're, you're one of the top guys in the industry. What is it going to take for you to take it to the next level? Is it going to be movies? Is it going to be getting one of those Hollywood scarlets? Uh, what is it going to be? For you to Look, get to that next level. I don't want to give any spoilers, but I will say this. There are definitely people in Hollywood who have contacted me, and it is most certainly something I am interested in. Well, is Burberry giving you any sort of residuals for, you know? What they should be doing is giving me a blowjob because I'm giving them incredible brand marketing every single day of my life. That's what they should be doing. No, I have not been contacted by Burberry. I think they're smart to stay in their lane and not try to mess with what we're doing here. Dennis? Max, is there one person? Oh, that my. Ever... <laughs> That's it. I think it's a wrap. <laughs> well, uh, since 
Dennis can't talk. Um, uh, oh. MJF, you know, thanks so much. It's for, so uh... unprofessional. <laughs> So, uh, who lets the mark on the podcast? That's what I want to know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, please give us five stars uh, when we're done. Um, <laughs> and you know, I'm assuming you're not coming back now, so uh, I could see your left arm. Uh, no, no, I, okay, I'm cool. All right, I'm cool. Yeah, I just right. need to take a walk. Lock I'm fine. I'm fine. God, that Dennis guy, man. <laughs> My God. <laughs> I'll allow two more questions and I'm out of here. Okay, okay. so Lars. I mean, Lars Sullivan, why not Lars Anderson? Okay, that's question one. Uh, we have a final question now. <laughs> Who's it going to be? <laughs> Go ahead, Dennis. Fuck it. You know, I'm going to wrap this up. Did you have a good time? Do you want the real answer? Yes. <laughs> I'd like all of you to take a very long walk off a very short fucking pier after this interview. Oh, I'm going to go fishing. My right God. Hey, I love it, Max. If you need any one of my four rings to add to your one, you let me know. Yeah, I'm sure they're, they're all very, 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 very costly. Are you aware that the Dynamite Diamond Ring is $100,000? I just had a jeweler look at it. $100,000. How much is one of your rings? What? what? Cup rings, bro. So I mean, you know, you can check it out online. You can go check it out. I was just—they're big, and you could really do some work with it. I was just offering because it's bigger than yours. So I was just saying, we're gonna help a brother out. This is worse than the last season of The Office. Um, <laughs> they oh bad. boy. Uh, okay, my name is Maxwell Jacob Friedman. I'm better than you and you know it. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at the underscore MJF. But let's face it, if you are listening to this podcast, you already follow me. 